I'm on the ninth floor of the L.A. County Courthouse. It's the celebrity murder floor. This is where O.J. Simpson was tried, and Phil Spector, the grim sleeper, the night stalker, and now Anthony Rauta. Rauta's been awaiting trial for over a year. He looks like he's aged a decade. He's in a restraint chair, arms strapped down, doubtless the result of so many courtroom disruptions. He gets wheeled in backwards by half a dozen deputies. They're filming him, but the judge won't let me record in the courtroom. So I take notes the old-fashioned way, by hand, in my reporter's notebook. By now, Rada's exhausted the public defender's office and the alternate public defender's office. He's on to a private attorney who represents indigent clients. But still, at almost every hearing, he's asking the judge, sometimes nicely, sometimes not, if he can represent himself. The question of Rauta's mental state hangs over the whole proceeding. Which Rauta will show up today? What will provoke his rage? Is anyone going to mention the fact that he seems completely unstable? Today, he's irate. He's yelling at the judge. The crime scene is outdoors. There was a fire. Where is his ballistics expert? Time is passing. Time he can't get back. I don't want to sit in jail another two years, he shouts. What do you want me to do, be dumb? Want me to close my eyes and my ears? I have a brain. I have a soul. So I use that. You don't tell me. I'm almost relieved when, at a later hearing, the judge expresses doubt about his competency to stand trial, even though that means everything will slow down while he's assessed and stabilized. But what he's yelling about today is something I've been thinking about, too. The evidence. What there is, what there isn't. And what it all adds up to in the case against Rauta. In other words, what's the theory of the case? How would Rauta have committed all these crimes? And more important, why? I'm Dana Goodyear. And this is Lost Hills. Episode 7, Morning Light. I'm holding a file stamped secret. It's the testimony that was presented to a grand jury, convened several months back. It's been unsealed. So finally, I can see what the prosecutor's thinking. This is her best argument. All the evidence she wants to present intact, unblemished, no holes poked by Rauta's defense attorney. That'll come later when the criminal trial gets underway. It's surprising. Remember near misses one through five, the shootings that used shotgun ammo? She says the reason law enforcement never found a shotgun is that there never was one. She says Anthony Rauta used a zip gun, a crude DIY weapon he made out of pipes and nails. She called various investigators to testify to the grand jury. They said they found shotgun shells at Rauda's camp that had markings indicating they hadn't been fired from a manufactured gun. They also said they found pipes and nails. But pipes and nails don't constitute a zip gun. They're just some of the elements. It's like if you walked into a kitchen and saw milk, eggs and sugar, some dirty cake pans. You might infer a cake had been made, but you also might wonder, where's the flour? The prosecutor says Rauta was fixated on killing. When the homemade zip gun didn't kill, she says, he left the area around Malibu Creek State Park, went to Northern California. Cell phone data places him there in January 2018. And when he came back a few months later, she says, he had a new weapon, a 9mm carbine. And that's what allowed him to fulfill 
his deadly plan. Hallelujah, blessed Mary, back. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, blessed Mary, crazy's back. So we went from a crudely cobbled together zip gun to a precise and deadly semi-automatic weapon, the 9mm carbine. I've never even heard of a zip gun and know almost as little about carbines. I call up Greg Block, the weapons expert, again. A zip gun is a homemade, make-it-yourself gun. Normally, shooting shotgun rounds, it's a couple pieces of pipe. He says everything you need to make a zip gun, you can get at the hardware store. The most basic would be a pipe to hold the shot shell, a nail, and something to force the nail into the back of the shell. Basically, they're a weapon for a person that cannot legally purchase one. So, since Rauta couldn't buy regular weapons and had gone to prison twice for having antique weapons, maybe the next logical step, the last resort, was to make his own. It also fits Rauta's survivalist lifestyle. One of his favorite survivalist authors wrote a book, which Rauta owned, called Guerrilla Gunsmithing, about making your own weapons. Greg tells me that zip guns are dangerous, clumsy, and imprecise. They're unreliable if not made properly. They do not have an effective range. A zip gun is for up-close personal. He says you've got to be really motivated to build one. Usually, it's hardcore gun geeks and teenagers. Depending upon the metal he's using for one or both pieces of pipe, it could blow up in his hand. Because when that round goes off, you're causing an explosion. And if you're not using good metal, that barrel could separate like a banana peels. And if you're holding that in your hands, it's going to get religious. The zip theory doesn't just explain why the detectives never found a shotgun. It could also explain a distinct feature of near misses one through five, the shotgun ammo shootings that took place well before Baudet's murder. In those incidents, the shooter fired only once. It was one of the oddities, along with the time of day and the area, that early on made Sergeant Wright and Lieutenant Royal think the crimes were connected. Reloading a zip gun takes time, which could mean getting caught, especially if your hunting ground is a crowded public park. So what about the other gun, the one Rauta was arrested with? The make and model was a Ruger PC-9. It looks just like a rifle, except that it takes a pistol cartridge. A pistol cartridge. In other words, Rauta's rifle took a 9 millimeter handgun round. See, that was the whole thing with the carbine going back to the Wild West. Whatever your handgun shot, your carbine shot, or your saddle rifle. In the Old West, you carried a bandolier that had one caliber, and it was used for your carbine and used for your handgun. The Ruger PC-9 resembles a short-barreled, military-style rifle. According to grand jury testimony, Rauta's had been modified. The stock, which rests on the shoulder, had been removed. Instead, it had a pistol grip. And how much does a carbine cost? Uh, you can get them for five or $600. I ask him what people use them for. Hunting? Home defense? Not really. They're more for plinking and target shooting. That's really what they're designed for. I mean, because it's a it's a handgun round, it's really not effective as a hunting um, rifle. So why would someone um, get one of these guns for reasons other than target practice? Availability. I believe that's what he had available for to him to get illegally, you know, he can't go into a gun store and buy a gun. He's, he's going to get refused. He will fail the California Department of Justice background clearance check. So my personal belief is it was probably stolen and he bought it from a fence. Or maybe he stole it himself. We don't know. Greg says that the Ruger PC-9 is a loud gun. There's actually two noises. One, you hear the noise of the um, gun going off. And then downrange, you hear 
what is basically, for lack of a better description, a sonic boom just like an airplane. I flash on Scott McCurdy, Tristan Baudet's brother-in-law, and his bleary thought in the early morning hours that he was hearing the crack of fireworks. And the sonic boom, is that what would sound possibly like fireworks? Yes, very much so. And how accurate is it? Out to 100 yards, you can do a headshot with it if you know what you're doing. That's a long range, but even at that maximum distance, the shooter still might have heard the Bodette girls crying. Before we get off the phone, I asked Greg for his best guess as to what happened to the zip gun, that cake that the prosecutor assumes existed, but which detectives never found. Once he got the newer, modern Ruger PC-9, he would either bury, hide, or stash his previous weapons. I don't see him throwing them away because he may need them down the road. I go back to thinking about the prosecutor's evidence. Based on what she presented to the grand jury, there's a lot she has and a lot she doesn't have. She doesn't have the zip gun, just some pipes and nails and spent shells with suspicious markings on them. She doesn't have witnesses placing Rauda at the scene of any of the near misses. And she doesn't have Rauda in the campground at Malibu Creek State Park with the rifle at the time of the murder. But she does have a lot of data from all those electronic devices found in Rauda's backpack and at his camp. Mark Donnell, that major crimes detective, told the grand jury that location data from the devices put Rauda in the general area of the park on the dates of many of the crimes. There's also the stuff that was stored on the devices. One of Rauda's phones had a file on how to make zip guns. The Kindle had one called Expedient Homemade Firearms. Rauda's search history tells a story, too. Quote, bullet hits car gas tank and, quote, 9 millimeter incendiary bullets. And on the morning of the murder, the prosecutor says, Rauda was nearby, and he was awake. An hour before Baudet was killed, one of Rauda's devices pinged on a nearby network, suggesting that he was in the area. About 10 minutes after Baudet was killed, Rauda searched breaking news headlines. Here's something else the prosecutor has, which will probably be more important in the eyes of a future jury than any other single piece of evidence. She has the sheriff's department weapons expert. He testified to the grand jury that the bullet excavated from Tristan Baudet's right shoulder was fired by Rauda's rifle. Beyond positing that Anthony Rauda was a killer bent on killing, the prosecutor hasn't offered much about why. Why would he have done these things? What would have motivated him? She's got ideas about the mechanics, but nothing about the meaning. From the research I've been doing, listening to his music, listening to him and his letters, reading all those court documents, I've started to see some patterns. I wonder if there's anything else out there that could help me understand him. I head back to the internet to see what else I can find out. He's got a couple of LinkedIn pages, a WordPress account, all those music sharing pages. He's Crazy Horse. He's Tony Rauta, MC. He was almost in hiding in the real world. But online, he really put himself out there. I think he wanted to be noticed as a musician, and also as a writer. I search up one of his aliases, Crazy Horse DeWan, and that's how I discover there's only one way to say it. A pair of manifestos. There is a great debate going on now about the Illuminati and New World Order. This is from one of them. It's called The True Illuminati. Rada posted it in 2018. Like Rada's letters, his writings are being read by an actor, 
and have been lightly edited for clarity. I first heard of the New World Order through music albums in the mid-1990s, and the Illuminati a few years later through the same channels. It's cut-and-paste conspiracy theory that tracks from King David to George Washington, Freemasons, Skull and Bones, Morgan Stanley, and the founder of FedEx. I obviously listened and formed my own opinion, but it was only years later when fighting some legal court cases that I seen firsthand the existence of these illuminary beings. The other manifesto is called the Luciferian Theory. It, too, was posted in 2018. On the cover, there's an etching of a voluptuous Eve handing an apple to Adam. They're naked in the garden, underneath the tree of knowledge. The snake dangles from a branch above. Just as there is a choice of good and evil, a person must decide between a nightmare or a vision in their way of thinking. This is where Lucifer dwells. The Luciferian theory is named for Lucifer. He was one of God's favorites until he tried to overthrow him and was cast out of heaven. Narcissism and sadism are the foundation of my theory. They are the devil's marks. After his banishment, Lucifer stopped by the Garden of Eden. Now with a God's eye, which means using facts and truth, we look into the paradise where what they call the stage is set, and Lucifer is about to set a scene in how to commit murder. Rout is fascinated by Satan. Satan was like a snake in the grass, that he could still move quickly and strike with one lethal move, and that he was cunning and beautiful also plays into the story. He says he, personally, has felt Satan's manipulations. Through my own experience from my family life, community, my short time in the army and the legal system, I have seen firsthand what mind games can accomplish or destroy. Mind games, he says, lead to pain, trauma, alienation, and ultimately paranoia. One of the most common tactics is to plant doubt in the individual, either by sexual inadequacy, such as thinking of homosexuality when they're not, bring out the individual's feelings of insecurity, shame, guilt, and by some force or threat cause feelings of loneliness. Then once alienated, they hope to wear the mind down. Paranoia develops, and the individual begins to become suspicious of those close to them person can feel betrayed of what is true and who to trust. Then there's the unfairness. That sense Rauta has that he is the victim. That supposedly good people do bad things to him, and then he gets punished for it. So why did these things happen? Did I do anything to these people? No. Shouldn't these people be suffering a state of hell and not me? The manifesto is dated April 9th, 2018. That's two and a half months before Tristan Baudet was killed. In it, Rauta sounds tortured, like he's in a cosmic battle for his soul. Like he said, a person must decide, nightmare or vision. Immortal vision, I promise you I will not lose my soul. The only official assessment I have of Rauta's mental health is a form attached to one of his court cases. It's a case he brought in 2006 against the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, claiming abuse and civil rights violations while he was in prison. Next to developmental problem, the form says abuse, 11th grade education, GED. If you read that as a chronology, it's a pretty awful coming-of-age story. The form says that in 2002, Rada twice attempted suicide by pills, and that he has a history of alcohol and marijuana use, and a history of depression, and PTSD. The PTSD stems from an alleged 2003 assault in the L.A. County Jail. Rada has documented this allegation elsewhere, that he was badly assaulted by five or six other inmates, and the deputies failed to protect him. His father, Ozzy, told me that the deputies were the ones who left his cell open, facilitating the attack. The form says he's been prescribed the antidepressant Lexapro and the antipsychotic Risperdal, which at low doses can be used to treat depression and at high doses is used to treat schizophrenia and bipolar disorder. 
In a letter from jail, Rada wrote, My mental health had got worse as I'd gotten older, but living alone has helped, even though being alone or in jail is what caused it. I'm not sleeping well right now. Somehow my thoughts get dark. I do not like taking medication. I usually receive counseling when I want, outside or inside. He told me that when it's up to him, he doesn't take meds. He also said he drinks, sometimes to the point of oblivion. When I was free, I drank liquor when I could, and my memory was sometimes bad. I would forget my age, write down what I needed to do so I wouldn't forget. I blacked out sometimes. Is he trying to tell me that he may have done things he doesn't even know he did? I'm trying to understand Rauta's psychology to imagine what his motive could have been. What I've been able to assemble, combing through his writings and court documents, is a weird, sad, scattered jumble. And it's far short of an explanation. Still nothing to suggest a why. I decide to call a psychologist. I find someone who specializes in adult male offenders, especially the connection between childhood trauma and adult deviance. His name is Dr. James Revis. He's never examined Anthony Rauda, but he agrees to give me some educated guesses. I tell him everything I know about Rauda's past, what I've observed, and the crimes he's accused of now. The heat that you were talking about in regard to his emotionality, that to me um, comes from something that he has undergone. You know, in other words, someone has betrayed his trust or hurt him, or at least he perceives that to be the case. Revis says it doesn't sound like Rauda is a psychopath. He sees him more as, quote, intelligent, wounded, impulsive, obsessional, and poorly skilled. I just have the sense as you talk that there's a lot of heat behind all of these acts, that they're not coldly premeditated in the service of gaining some good, that there's, there's a lot behind that. Rauda, he says, sounds like a textbook narcissist. You also mentioned that he acted as his own attorney in court. And many, many narcissistic criminals will do that. Ted Bundy did that, for example, um, because they believe that they are smarter than their own counsel. And so then it may be that the murder and the shootings are sort of um, a narcissistic compensation for feelings of in- insecurity. My guess is it may make him feel very, very powerful. If, in fact, he set fires, it may make him feel very, very powerful. It's his way of sort of giving the middle finger to the world. I've witnessed Rauda do exactly, literally this. Give the middle finger to the TV cameras in court. My guess is what's happening is it makes him feel omnipotent, all-powerful. And probably in that moment, it's massively relieving of all of these other negative tensions inside of him. So shooting cars and people could make him feel masculine, powerful, and important. Godlike, even. Getting to decide who lives and who dies. It could be very satisfying for someone who's identified as a victim for so long. He's going away with a bang. He's pronoun- if he's doing these things, he's pronouncing that he's still there. He's going away and then coming back and engaging in aggression. You know, so to me, it's anger, narcissism, and paranoia. Well, that's one person, anyway, who can figure an explanation for a series of violent crimes against unsuspecting strangers. But in his letters and in court, Rauta keeps saying he's innocent. I go back to his writings, the manifesto he published just before Tristan Baudet's murder. I force myself to reread the Luciferian theory. Rada makes a lot of connections. There's stuff about the third eye, the sun, and there's a lot about Lucifer. Lucifer equals light equals enlightenment. To stay on the subject, my theory of an ancient secret knowledge being passed down through history by Lucifer. The name Lucifer literally means the morning star, the planet Venus, or as light bringing onto the highest of initiates. Lucifer, the name, actually means the one who brings the light, the morning star, first light. That makes me think about the timing of the crimes, just before the morning light. And something I'd skimmed right past before 
jumps out at me this time. Rauta makes a reference to St. John's Day, the feast day of John the Baptist. It's in late June, and it's a big deal to Freemasons, some of the Illuminati Rauta frets about the most. He writes that it, quote, happens to be Midsummer's Day, the day the sun is at its strongest. Midsummer's Day, the day the sun is at its strongest, is the solstice, the longest day of the year. It's a day that, in old religious myths, represents a turning point in the battle between light and shadow, when the winter king begins his ascendance by killing the summer king. In 2018, Midsummer's Day was June 21st, the day Tristan Baudet took his children camping the last day of Tristan Baudet's life. I've been living with Anthony Rauta for two and a half years now. My office is full of his stuff. At one end of my desk, I keep a stack of books on how to disappear, how to survive an apocalypse, live off the land, build a bomb, or make a gun from scratch. They're all books I know he's owned at one time or another in his life. I've got file boxes of notebooks, court filings, letters, his lists of grievances, misdirections, red herrings, split hairs. Why has no one asked law enforcement why they have lied? Why has no lawyer wished to represent me? Why has no one tried to prove my accusations of the sheriff's assaulting me as lies? Why did the sheriff tell the media I was a suspect in the murder of Mr. Baudet on the day of my arrest, when the rifle had not been tested and I did not admit any wrongdoing? Why is there no direct evidence leading me to the attempted murder? when the Sheriff's Department official statement to Lieutenant Royal is that these crimes were not connected. Why did Lieutenant Royal's investigation not lead to any suspects? The media's portrayal of me has been slanderous. I have not been to Malibu in years. I spend a lot of time looking at his drawings, especially one that was published in a prison literary magazine in 2016, the year he was most recently released. On the left are two cops, surrounded by little word bubbles that say 911. On the right, a snake and an apple with a bite out of it. Above that, the gates of Eden, with Adam and Eve standing underneath a radiant tree of knowledge. They look like they're walking away to the east of Eden after the fall. I feel like I know Rauta a little now, and I think he's grafted this story of paradise and loss onto his own. And his artist's name, Crazy Horse, it's not random either. The original Crazy Horse defeated Custer's army at the Battle of the Little Bighorn. He met the army in steep and treacherous terrain, then killed Custer and every last one of his men. That sounds like a Rauta revenge fantasy come true. And you know how Crazy Horse died? Resisting imprisonment. I don't like me fall in love and rather better be off dead. Rauta says he's not guilty, and the trial will determine that. But here's what I think. Part of Anthony Rauta wants to be left alone. Part of him is dying for a fight. And now that I know about his hatred of police, his long and contentious relationship with the Lost Hills cops, I have my own theory of the case. It was never about Tristan Baudet or campers or someone getting in his way as he was stealing food. I think Rauta camped behind Lost Hill Station and started shooting off his guns to make fools of the cops, to draw them into a fight in treacherous terrain where he was comfortable, to kill them or be killed. One of the cops told me that during Rauta's arrest, he was shouting at the deputies stuff like, kill me, fucking shoot me, before I get you. On my desk, I keep a map I printed out that covers Malibu Creek State Park and the surrounding area. 
It's annotated with every crime Rada is accused of. Dates, victims, jurisdiction, ammunition. I also marked Rada's camp, north of a hairpin turn on Mulholland Highway. I need to get out there. I still haven't been. I search my inbox for correspondence with Lou, the guy in the MAGA hat that I met on the tour of Malibu Creek State Park. I remember he said he'd take me to Rada's camp. And that's how I come across a photo album that Lou shared with me a while back. Pictures he took when he went to Rada's camp a few weeks after he was arrested. I click through them again. I've looked at them a handful of times, always with a vaguely disappointed feeling. They look like nothing. Dry gray and brown leaves littering the hillsides, pieces of blue tarp. Boring. But this time, I see something I never noticed before. In one of the pictures, there's a piece of scrap wood that looks almost like garbage. It's roughly L-shaped, with all kinds of crude notches and cuts. An odd shape, like a puzzle piece. By now, I've spent a lot of time looking at diagrams and images of homemade guns. In Rado's books, on YouTube. Am I seeing what I think I'm seeing? This piece of wood looks to me like the frame for a zip gun. Maybe the last ingredient Rada would have needed to bake the cake. And it was in his camp. I call up Greg Block again. He's the weapons expert. Okay, can you, yeah, describe what you see. It doesn't look like a random piece of wood. It looks like it was made to do something or be something. Um, I mean, it's got a lot of cuts in it that are made for a certain reason. On one side, there's what looks like a handle or a way to grip it. Above that, part of the wood has been removed, possibly to make space for a barrel. And just in front of the grip is another series of cuts notches in a zigzag line. Those notches are very crude and rudimentary. It was done by hand. And then you'd have to ask, why is that piece of wood in this area? It is definitely suspicious. It's been cut and designed for one thing. Which is? Something to launch a projectile, commonly referred to as a zip gun. The investigators knew they were looking for a zip gun. And they knew they hadn't found all the necessary elements. So if you're law enforcement and you know you're looking for a zip gun and you see this on the ground, what do you do? You take it as evidence. This idea is so crazy. I call up a couple of hardcore gun geeks, YouTubers who make guns all the time. We talk about the limitations of the photograph. It's taken from above, so it doesn't show the object in three dimensions. Close inspection might yield other interpretations. But still, they both say, yeah, I can see that. It's not crazy to think this might be a prototype or a rough draft. One of them says, I can make a zip gun out of that. Law enforcement never found the weapon used in near misses one through five. They found some elements, pipes and nails, but nothing close to a finished product. Could this be the missing ingredient? The cops combed through Rada's camp multiple times, and no one picked it up. And you know what happened the day after Lou took that photo? The Woolsey fire. So now, in all likelihood, it's been reduced to ash. And all that exists is this photograph. Zip guns have another name. They're known as ghost guns. They're untraceable. They disappear. I'm having a holy shit kind of realization. But it's not that I think I've discovered the lost puzzle piece that solves the Rauda case. It's that law enforcement overlooked this. An object at Rauda's camp that your average gun geek on YouTube could make a weapon from. The Los Angeles Sheriff's Department, of course, won't comment. But I can't stop wondering, how could they have missed this? How could they not see it? It's almost like denying the existence of the Canyon Shooter became a habit, 
that law enforcement couldn't break. They were so used to saying that there was nothing going on out there, no mystery to solve, that they couldn't recognize what was right before their eyes. Lost Hills is written and hosted by me, Dana Goodyear. It's produced by Western Sound and Pushkin Industries. For more information about my investigation, follow at Lost Hills Pod on social media. Up next, Episode 8, East of Eden.